Welcome to the National Press Club, the world's leading professional organization for journalists. I'm Mike Friedman, immediate past president of the National Press Club. I'm the former general manager of CBS Radio Network, now journalist in residence at University of Maryland Global Campus, and executive producer of The Kalb Report, public broadcasting series moderated by today's virtual headliners guest, journalist Marvin Kalb. We're pleased to accept questions from those tuning in today. I will ask as many as time permits. To submit a question, please email headliners at press.org. For 27 years now, I've had the privilege and pleasure of working with and introducing this gentleman for 101 Kalb Report programs here at the National Press Club. And the introduction is always the same. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the last correspondent personally hired at CBS News by Edward R. Murrow and the gold standard of broadcast journalism, my friend and colleague, Marvin Kalb. Hey, thank you, Mike. That's the kindest intro. Please do it again and again. <laughs> <laughs> For his 17th book, just published by Brookings Press, Marvin presents the second installment of his autobiography. It is entitled, Assignment Russia, Becoming a Foreign Correspondent in the Crucible of the Cold War. Marvin has described the book as a long letter home after an unforgettable personal adventure. It covers the period of his life from his arrival at CBS in 1957 through his years as Moscow correspondent from 1960 to 1963. It is a personal and professional coming of age story, one that has deep roots in family history and a love of the country that welcomed oppressed people from around the world with open arms and opportunity. Marvin, once again, welcome back to the National Press Club. Thank you, Mike. It is a pleasure for me to be here. I thank the Press Club and you especially, Mike, for not only being a gracious introducer, but also the guy who opens so many doors. Marvin, he called you professor, you called him sir, yes. and he described you to colleagues as our kind of guy. I'm speaking, of course, of Edward R. Murrow, mentor to you and icon to the rest of us. Talk about the beginning of your career at CBS, which is where the book begins. Right, well, the book begins with uh, what may strike people as an odd chapter. Uh, but if you have ever been a journalist and you ever arrive at that first moment when you know that you have become professionally a journalist, what is it like? And I can tell you that for me, in June, late June of 1957, it was certainly not what I had expected. I had expected of CBS News, a huge newsroom, lots of people screaming, reporters trying to get their copy in as quickly as possible, editors screaming for copy, producers getting upset, uh, AP wires, UPI wires, everybody screaming, news, news, news. I walked in at midnight on a midnight to 8 a.m. shift of CBS, 52nd Street and Madison Avenue. And Mike, there wasn't a soul there. Nobody. I walked into an empty newsroom. And there is nothing more empty in life for a journalist than an empty newsroom. I was going off for my PhD up at Harvard in Russian history. I knew, I thought, how to write a PhD dissertation. But no one, when they hired me, no one had ever said, Marvin, you're going to have to write a three minute and 55 second radio broadcast. No one told me how to do it. I hadn't a clue. I walked in, there was nobody there, and I was sort of terrified. And I kept walking around from one ticker tape to another looking at news, but the ticker tapes were miraculously silent that night. No one was helping me. And I began to go into a panic at about three o'clock in the morning, when suddenly bells went off at the Reuters ticker, which is what happened in those days. 
Bells indicated a bullet. Picked myself up, ran over to Reuters, ripped the copy off, and it read 27 people died when the boat they were in capsized in the Ganges River in India. And my first reaction, I'm ashamed to say it, was thank God. And it was thank God for me because I had a news story. I had something to write about. And I finally did write something and I gave it to the editor who came in at 4.30 in the morning, a bouncy guy with a Yankee baseball hat, um, carried his lunch with him in a small bag. Um, he says, you must be Cal. I said, yes, who are you? He said, I'm Hal Kel and I'm your editor. Do you have your copy? I said, yes, sir. I gave it to him. He sat down and he looked at it and my heart dropped because I was hoping there'd be a smile on his face, something to indicate satisfaction. But at about five minutes to five, he threw my copy aside, put in fresh paper into his typewriter and batted out at a ferocious speed, batted out a new story, uh, the whole broadcast, did it himself. At a minute to five, a man came in, picked it up, went into Studio 9, read it, and to my ear, it sounded like my earlier vision of CBS. It was so well done. But of course, I didn't do it. Hal Turkel did it. And when the, the broadcast was over, he came over to me and he said, put his arm on my shoulder, he said, Marvin, you're a really good writer, but you don't know how to write a radio newscast. And he explained what it was like. And he became one of my great teachers. I loved how to tell. There often is a moment in time, Marvin, when <clears throat> you can merge what you bring to the mix with what you learn on the job. And was there, was, was it evolutionary for you? Was there a particular moment when you felt, I've got this, I really can, I really can do this? Mike, this may come as a surprise, but to this day, I never feel that I've got it. I always feel that I am doing the best I can to convey information to the public as honestly as I can, as straightforwardly as I can. But I can tell you right now that satisfaction with my own work is never something that I have felt. I always have a sense that it could be a lot better and that I ought to try harder. And, but I can say to you that when I was in Moscow for the first time as a reporter, which was in May of 1960. I did feel a coming together of the knowledge that I had accumulated about Russia, uh, the language, the history, the culture, the economics, all of that stuff that I had been picking up in college and in graduate school and working at the US Embassy in Moscow in 1956-7 and the requirements of taking that knowledge and putting it into a minute radio spot, a minute and a half television spot. And somehow or another, despite the compression, still to convey the reality, the substance, honestly, to the American people as best I could. So in a sense, the two did come together but never to my total satisfaction. I'd like to read you something and get your view of it. Our wonderful mutual friend and colleague, Richard C. Hotlet, offered the following oh, yes. description of Ed Murrow. Dick said, even now, many years later, I think of Ed Murrow in superlatives, a skilled, tenacious reporter and a brave man, a fine human being. As a boss, Murrow laid down no rules, made no suggestions as to style or content. He demanded only a clear and, where appropriate, colorful presentation of fact. He was scrupulously fair, and his colleagues accepted his choices without complaint. He led by example, not command. 
Moreau's usually furrowed brow expressed a pessimistic side, perhaps to guard against indulging a nationwide audience that wanted good news. Yet, when he smiled, it was like a sunrise. He knew his own worth, but was not arrogant or overbearing. He had a sense of theater, as in his stress on This is London, as well as a Churchillian sonority that often marked his speech. Moreau's physical bravery was matched by his moral courage that rang out in his television documentaries. His style was serious. Long experience at the microphone did not make him casual. He saw his broadcast as a service to the American people. An accurate depiction, Marvin? Oh, absolutely. That that is so beautifully stated only by somebody who worked with Moreau for a long time, which is certainly what Dick Hodlett did. He started with Murrow way back in 1944 in London. Uh, he was a, a young, eager reporter who spoke German. We were at war with Germany. And he wanted very much to persuade Murrow, who was sort of the bureau chief of CBS in London, um, to hire him. And Murrow had a doubt about his uh, broadcasting capability. But he eliminated that immediately because he said to a friend, he knows what the story is. He knew the story. <clears throat> Mike, I can tell you that the first time I met Murrow was in May of 1957. I had written an article for the New York Times Magazine about Soviet youth. I was in White Library on Monday morning And the librarian came over to me and said, Marvin, there's a guy on the phone named Ed Murrow, um, and he would like to talk to you. I turned to the librarian in one of the stupidest sequences in my life and said, Ed Murrow is not calling me. Forget about it. It's obviously some quack. Just hang up on him. Now, I don't know whether she actually hung up on him. But late that afternoon, she came back to me and said, Marvin, it's that same man, and he still calls himself Ed Murrow. And maybe you want to pick up the phone and talk to him. And so I didn't believe he was calling me. But when I heard his voice, that magnificent voice, I what a total jackass I had been. How could I not pick up the phone the first time? And I apologized to him repeatedly. And he said, don't worry about that. Can you come and see me tomorrow morning in New York in my office at nine o'clock? I said, yes, sir, I'll be there. And he answered, professor, I'll see you. And that established that professor, sir, relationship that we had with each other. I was there the following morning. Mike, his secretary said to me as I walked in, Mr. Murrow was very busy. You know, he's only got about a half hour. I said, absolutely fine with me. We spoke for three hours. Murrow asked me question after question about the Soviet Union, about Soviet youth, their religion their education, when they got married, did they have an apartment? What was it like with in-laws? He wanted to know everything about the Soviet Union, which was our principal adversary in the midst of the Cold War. And after we spoke for three hours, he put his arm on my shoulder as we walked out. And he said, oh, by the way, how would you like to work for CBS? It took me all of three seconds, I think, that long to say, yes, sir, I'll be here. And that is the way he hired me. And Dick's description of him is so perfect because he did often look as if he carried the weight of the world on his shoulders. And he probably felt that way too. But he also felt that he had an obligation to convey reality no matter how tough it might be to hear, convey reality to the American people and they will decide 
what it is that had to be done. Your job as the reporter was simply to provide them with the information. They can then use the information as they chose. And Murrow felt that very seriously. You mentioned that uh, Dick Hodlett spoke German. You speak Russian and are a scholar yeah. in Russian studies, uh, as is your wife, Madeline. Uh, yes. Tell us about the underpinnings of your interest in Russian studies and your desire to be in Moscow. Um, that's a long story, and I'll try to I'll try to cut it to a minute and a half. Um, my mother and father were both products of the Tsarist Empire, which stretched then into Poland, Ukraine. It was a very large empire. My father came here in 1914, just before the outbreak of World War I, my mother in 1913. And this country opened, welcomed, opened its doors and welcomed these two people who had suffered different forms of religious persecution. They welcomed them to the United States. And they provided them with the opportunity, nothing is guaranteed, but they provided them with the opportunity for personal freedom, for religious observance as they chose, and for economic chance, opportunity. If you can pull it off, great, but you don't necessarily pull it off. And I felt right then and there as a reporter, I wanted to pay back. That's an expression that uh, is very special to me. Anyway, the idea is <clears throat> you pay back this country for what this country has done for you. It had done wonderful things for my mother and father, and then for us as their offspring. And this was an opportunity in this book to describe them to describe my brother, my sister, um, in a way that gives a reader an opportunity for understanding payback. Thank you, America, for what it is that you did for my parents and then for us. And Murrow was somebody who understood that immediately. And um, I wouldn't talk to him about this then because I didn't know enough about payback. But I do now, and I feel very strongly that it is important that everybody have an opportunity to pay back the country that gives them the opportunity for religious freedom, political freedom, and economic opportunity. Um, let's stay in Moscow now, um, and we have a series of questions um, about your time spent there, your prep for it, and uh, the execution of your duties there. Uh, from uh, former National Press Club President Gil Klein, you were in Moscow during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Did you think war was imminent? What were the signs that you were seeing? Um, let me point out also, I didn't quite complete my earlier thought you asked me about getting into Moscow. Um, my brother, Bernie, who um, has always been extremely influential in my life, he is the one who essentially steered me in the direction of the study of Russia, the study of the Russian language. And I then did a great deal of work in the army when I was in the army, in army intelligence. So that gave me a clearance that allowed me then to work at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. Uh, Morrow then offers me the job and he sends me, in effect, he's the one more than anyone else who made it clear that I was to go to Moscow. And that was in May of 1960. Cuban Missile Crisis is October of 62. By that time, I was an experienced Moscow correspondent. I sort of felt that I knew what it was that the Russians were trying to say to the Americans as well as to their own people. 
And the question about whether I thought we would have war, yes, that possibility certainly ran through my mind, but I did not feel ever through the Cuban Missile Crisis that we were going into war. I felt that this was an effort by Nikita Khrushchev to solve the Berlin crisis, which he described as a bone in my throat. And he wanted to end that crisis by frightening the United States into striking a deal that would lead to Russian control over Earl of, of all of Berlin and the United States withdrawal from Berlin, Western Berlin. Um, so I saw this as diplomacy, very dangerous diplomacy, but as diplomacy and not a step toward war. And of course that made it easy for me, but my boss in New York, a wonderful man named Blair Clark, uh, asked me whether I wanted to send Mady, my wife, off to shopping in Scandinavia to get her out of Moscow because he feared that there could very well be an attack. I did not agree. I didn't think there would be. <laughs> Here's a question from uh, our friend Sam Litzinger, who uh, is a member of the National Press Club. Um, During the Cold War, Americans tended to think of an ordinary Russian as a kind of mysterious other about whom they knew little. Uh, could you share some stories of Russians you met and how they impressed you? Um, Sam, let me tell you that um, Russians come in many different shapes and sizes. <laughs> they are not uh, of a standard form. There are Russian intellectuals with whom any Harvard professor could feel very comfortable spending an entire day, week, month, or year with. Uh, First-rate scholarship, wonderful people. And there are also people like Putin who run the country. And there are many bureaucrats in between. And through Russian history, there has been truly a sense that the Russian people require a strong leader, somebody who will tell them what to do, and they do it. And for many, many years, that was indeed the case. But what struck me as fascinating was in that first time that I was there with Nikita Khrushchev. Khrushchev, as the leader of the Soviet Union, wanted to initiate a program, a policy of reform throughout the entire country. He did some of that but he got into trouble doing that with a lot of conservatives who said this far and no further, in fact, get back. And so in 1956, he delivered an historic speech denouncing Stalin and saying, in effect, let's open the door to a little bit of activity, a little bit of motion. But the door was shut. And that happened after Khrushchev with Brezhnev who kind of, the whole country kind of just stopped. And then Gorbachev arrived and he opened the doors once again. And there was a possibility that democracy under his successor Yeltsin could actually happen in modern day Russia where people would be able to travel, talk, open up, do things that are exciting um, at this particular time, we are in an earlier period now with Putin cracking down. And where we are, unfortunately, is at a moment when the doors are being shut on Russian talent. I mean, think back to the Russian writers, the musicians, the composers. My God, you can't, you can't be at a concert without bumping into a Russian, a piece of Russian music. It, they're all over the place. So it's there, it's there. But there's a heavy hand of oppression sitting on it. There's a follow-up from Sam uh, about something you just mentioned. How is the Russian concept of democracy different from the West's, America in particular? 
Well, first of all, the sense, Sam, that they don't know they can ever get it, really. And what they have in mind is something that is not quite a Western style of democracy. I think they have an exaggerated sense of democracy in much the same way, by the way, I go back now a little bit. When people like my father came to this country in 1914, he felt before he got here, he felt that this country was in English translated, a golden paradise, that there would be money in baskets on every street corner for people just to dip into. He had a totally hyped exaggeration of freedom and democracy. And I think the Russian people today have essentially that same idea. Putin and his people are trying to paint the West and American democracy as bad stuff, poisonous. That democracy is them. We are separate, we are great. And he's trying to draw a distinction between us and them. And I have to quickly add a distinction that many American politicians who call themselves extreme conservatives, Trump followers, try to say essentially the same thing, that it's we against them, the bad guys. The Russians are saying essentially the same thing. There's a question from uh, Bill McCarran, the executive director of the National Press Club. Can you discuss the process you used to meet with Russian sources? Did any of these come into danger because of contact with you? And how do you feel about that? Yeah, well, I was talking to somebody yesterday and tried to explain. They asked me, how would it, what would it be like for a, an American journalist working in Russia today as opposed to when you were there? And one of the points that I was trying to make was, in my time, things were so tight in the middle of the Cold War, communism in its heyday. If I went over and talked to a Russian citizen on the street, asked him a question, where is Red Square? It is likely, not certain, but likely, that some KGB person, some police person, would go over to that Russian citizen and begin to question him about what is it that that foreigner wanted from you. In other words, in asking the simplest question of a Russian, then you could get that Russian into a lot of trouble. And if I got information from a Russian source, and I have to be very clear about this. They didn't come dangling like fruit from a tree in springtime. They were very rare indeed, because everybody lived in a frightening environment, tight environment. But those that I did know and those who did talk to me, they took huge risks. And I took a risk too in possibly opening them to a KGB crackdown on them and their family. So it was always on your mind as a reporter, it should have been, that you could get these people into terrible trouble. So be careful. Um, an interesting follow-up from Bill McCarran. Did the Russians ever try to recruit you when you were there? And uh, <laughs> what was that like, if so, and did you report it? <laughs> uh, I'm sorry Bill, to disappoint you, but to the best of my knowledge, maybe they tried it and I wasn't even aware of it, but to the best of my knowledge, um, nobody ever tried to recruit me as such. You did get into conversations with Russians, you would have to, uh, in which they would try to persuade you that their system of government was really better than yours. Um, maybe that was an effort to win me over to their point of view, but if it was, it failed. And I, I'm not aware of any serious professional effort to hook me into their system. From what you shared in your uh, first uh, 
autobiographical book, The Year I Was Peter the Great, and, and what you share in Assignment Russia. Um, uh, we learn more about Nikita Khrushchev, the Soviet premier, and about your most interesting relationship with him and his relationship with you from beginning with the title of, of, of your, your first book. Um, uh, talk about that relationship with, with Nikita Khrushchev. Well, um, I'll do it in two stories. The first story takes us back to July 4th, 1956, at the US Embassy, actually at Spazzo House, the ambassador's residence, and Nikita Khrushchev arrived with the entire Politburo. And that was a big deal because it indicated he wanted to be friends with us. And at the embassy at that time, there were only four people who spoke Russian. There was the ambassador, two senior officers, and me, and I was the kid on the block, believe me, I had no authority, was doing nothing of any real importance. I was a translator, I was an interpreter, kind of junior press officer. Um, but Ambassador Boland said that I was to look after Marshal Zhukov, who was the defense minister. And Marshal Zhukov loved to drink. I did not. And I was there while he socked back eight vodkas. And when the party was over, he kind of um, sidled up to Khrushchev and said, I was drinking, by the way, water while he drank vodka. And he went over to Khrushchev and he said, I have finally found a young American who can drink like a Russian. Khrushchev burst into laughter and he said, how tall are you? I said, I'm three centimeters shorter than Peter the Great. He loved that line. To this day, I haven't a clue as to how the thought even entered my brain, but it did, I said it. And he then always associated me with Peter the Great. And second story, on my first big story, which was in Paris, May 1960, there was a summit meeting, never quite happened, supposedly devoted to Berlin on the division of Berlin and the danger of Berlin. And two weeks before that summit, our U-2 spy plane was shot down over Russia. And so when we arrived in Paris to cover the summit, <clears throat> and it was my first big story, my responsibility was to cover Khrushchev. So I knew him from this experience, several experiences similar to that in 1956 in my Peter the Great mode. And so my foreign editor asked, what Marvin are you going to do covering Khrushchev? And I said, I know that he normally goes out in the morning for a walk, a brief walk. Let me have a crew at 6 a.m. I'll be in front of the Russian embassy. If he comes out, maybe I can get an interview with him. He, he was reluctant, but he said, okay. Following day I was there, six o'clock, CBS crew sets up. It's absolutely quiet as can be. And 6.30 comes around and the Cameraman says, Philippe was his name. Uh, Marvin, are you sure Khrushchev's going? I said, I'm not sure of anything. But he often comes out. And at seven o'clock, large iron doors to the embassy open up. Khrushchev emerges with two bodyguards. I looked at him, I was thrilled. And we, the crew and I rushed toward him. And he looked at me and he said, um, well, he says, here comes Peter the Great. And, <laughs> and he said, he then turned, oh, by the way, his two bodyguards immediately reached into their inner jackets to pull out what I assume was a weapon. And Khrushchev looked and said, no, 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 no. He's okay, he's Peter the Great. We then walked down a block and there was a French bakery, seven o'clock in the morning producing 
the most magnificent croissants. The aroma filled the air. And I looked at him and he looked at me, Khrushchev, and he said, have you ever had those? I said, oh yeah, they're wonderful. He said, do you think I would like it? I said, I'm sure you would. He said, I would like it. And I ran into the bakery, bought a whole bunch of croissants, gave him a bunch for him and his, his two bodyguards, me and my crew. He ate it the minute I saw his face. It just erupted into Slavic heaven. He loved it. Oh, delicious. He loved it. And then I knew I had a terrific exclusive. And then I went after him, not after him, but asked him questions about Berlin. Would he show up for the summit? Would he insist on certain things that President Eisenhower could or could not deliver? It was a terrific interview. It was exclusive and CBS had it that night for their evening news program. And that was my opening to being a foreign correspondent. And it was exciting. It was terrific. That was it. <laughs> um, more questions uh, have come in. Uh, covering the Soviet government has been described as reading signs by who appeared in the lineup of leaders atop Lenin's tomb during official events. Um, is that what you found? And how hard was it to get any kind of contacts within the government? Uh, extremely difficult to get contact within the government unless it was set up in advance by somebody in the government who wanted either to win you over, to make you more sympathetic, uh, to go back earlier to Bill's question, maybe to make an effort to win you over completely. But it was always um, uh, their decision to try to reach out to you and to get you so you would have then an opportunity of talking to people in the government, but that was rare. That was pretty well set up in advance. It was very difficult for you to meet a government official on your own. No, that didn't happen that way. And when they lined up on the Lenin Mausoleum uh, at a very major May 1st holiday, for example, the person who stood in front of the microphones to speak you knew was the single most important person in the Soviet Union. And in my time in the 50s and 60s, uh, it was Nikita Khrushchev or Leonid Brezhnev. And then as you went down from him in the picture, let's say I'm looking at you now, Mike, but let's say I was looking at Nikita Khrushchev, Lenin Mausoleum, in front of a microphone. To his right, you knew was the second most important person in the Soviet Union. And that was called Kremlinology. You read signs and pictures in newspapers, who was covered, who was not, who was given positive coverage, who was ignored. That was Kremlinology and it was, it was exciting, it was fun. It really was, it was an interesting, challenge that you had to meet if you were to be a successful journalist in, in Russia. And how challenging was it, Marvin, to, um, to get your reports out of um, Russia uh, when you were filing for whether it was the World News Roundup on radio or CBS Evening News uh, on television? Uh, did you ever have to write in, in some code in order to uh, ensure that your messages in your stories uh, would be received and understood? Yeah, um, until April of 1961, there was direct censorship of all copy from foreign correspondents. So you would have to find a way of saying something that would convey reality and somehow get the words through the censor. And I can give you one illustration the way I can give you many, but one that was very funny to me uh, the Russians at one point wanted to prove to the rest of the world that they were interested in disarmament. And they wanted to show that the Red Army was being disarmed. And they took a group of reporters, me included, to a base outside of Minsk. And 
when we arrived there, there was one small detachment of Russian soldiers who raised their rifles in the air and threw them down on the ground and shouted, to peace. And then the flak, the guy from the government who was telling us what was happening, he said, you see, we are interested in peace and we're giving up our weapons. My broadcast that evening was 20, no, um, a group of Western correspondents were taken for a ride today, this time to Minsk, where they were told they were watching the disarmament of the Red Army. Now, I was saying exactly what happened. I didn't put in any fancy word, but that phrase taken for a ride, the American ear would pick up and know instantly what was going on. But the censor in Russia didn't know that phrase. So I was able to get away with it. But that, and that was the test, the battle that you had with the censor every time you wanted to get something across. It was always, um, what kind of phrase could you use that the American audience would understand, but the Russian censor would not? That was our daily challenge. It was great fun too. <laughs> Thank you. Another another question. Uh, tell us about your contacts with the dissidents, particularly the Jewish refuseniks. Uh, did you have a special affinity for them? How did you cover that issue? I would have had special affinity for them, but they were not a story when I was there. They became a story later in the 1970s uh, I was there in the 50s and 60s. I returned many times to the Soviet Union, but briefly, uh, maybe for uh, two or three days for a story, and then I was out. So I did not have an opportunity to cover the um, Jewish, but not just Jewish, other dissidents as well. People who were, by the 1970s, fed up with this stultifying oppressive communist system and had the guts to stand up and join others and actually express their discontent and disapproval of their political system. And they were called dissidents and refuseniks. And uh, a number of them who were Jewish and wanted to go to Israel um, tried very hard to get out of the Soviet Union most of the time they failed, but when the Russians wanted to make a point, they sent thousands of Russian Jews to Israel to make a diplomatic point. It was not suddenly being nice to Jews, it was uh, making a diplomatic point. So they, in a sense, got rid of those people they didn't like anyway. A couple of then and now questions uh, that have come in. Do you see the current Russian misinformation campaign as an extension of the propaganda you saw there or something entirely new? There are some follow-ups. Was the audience different uh, in your day? Um, it was to make the rest of the world doubt America. Now it seems to be designed to pit us against ourselves. It's a very good question. And uh, the first part of the answer is that the Russians have been engaged in this kind of what is called kompromat, what is called straight out propaganda for many, many, many decades. They are very good at taking ideas and twisting them and then putting it out into circulation. What they are doing now is using this old, technique, pinning it to modern technology, and then aiming it at a target, in this case, the American political system. What is amazing to me, Mike, is how could so many people in this country, raised in an atmosphere of freedom, where you're supposed to be aware of truth and know the difference between truth and a lie, how could it be that tens of millions of American system, citizens bought into 
the Russian propaganda system. That is astounding to me. To this day, I don't quite understand how it could be, but there is no doubt that it is. Tens of millions of Americans are prepared to accept a Russian version of reality than they are to accept an American version. That's astounding. It's interesting because it brings us back to journalism uh, with that. And of course, within our country, we have spent the better part of the last five years or so uh, with journalists being called the enemy of the people by former President uh, Donald Trump. It was the title of a book that uh, you had published during the Trump uh, administration. And it seems that the, the role of the journalist today has become that much more important as well as perhaps dangerous. Talk about that. Well, there is no question, Mike, that it is a danger from a number of points of view. When a president of the United States links free American journalists to enemies of the state, enemies of the people, was he aware that that expression was one of the favorite expressions of Joseph Stalin in the Soviet Union, of Mao Zedong in China, of Benito Mussolini in Italy, in other words, the favorite of dictators, often either communist or fascist dictators. And an American president uses that kind of expression to, to, to define an American journalist, I found horrible and felt the need to write the book, Enemy of the People. But Mike, even more terrifying than that, the president used that expression very effectively and many, many, again, tens of millions of American citizens believed him. The net result right now is that many people in this country, 60% of people in the Republican Party, according to recent polls, do not believe that Joe Biden won the election fairly. 52% of Republicans believe that the press deliberately distorted the result of the American presidential campaign. Why would they believe that? Because Donald Trump said so. And then a lot of people who represent part of the American press corps, who simply feel that it's in their interest, I'm not quite sure, maybe they mean only financial, I hope not political, uh, interest to propagandize this idea. So it's dangerous for the country and democracy. It is dangerous for journalism and very dangerous the, for the American people. But I sincerely hope that more and more of them will understand that there is a distinction between a free press and a press that is married to a particular political point of view. This past year has been a head spinner for all of us between <laughs> the pandemic, the politics, the protests, the presidential election, the failed insurrection at the U.S. Capitol, and the security-laden inauguration of President Biden and Vice President Harris. At the same time, uh, we have found in record time effective vaccines to combat the coronavirus, and we appear to be on the cusp of a recovery. Um, based on your experiences, including those articulated in these two autobiographical volumes, what is your view of the state of our democracy today and, and the state of the world? Fragile, Mike, fragile. I think that our democracy today has demonstrated a fragility that perhaps many of us did not quite appreciate, did not quite appreciate it until it was challenged so dramatically during the Trump era. 
when, as I said before, facts uh, became weapons of war and denounced as weapons and not accepted as truth. Uh, we are at a point now, I find myself in absolute agreement with President Biden when he describes the political atmosphere in the United States today as a war between democracy on the one side and authoritarianism on the other side. Those are the words he used to define the state of American political life today. In other words, Democrats who believe in truth and can accept truth and authoritarians who believe they control truth and can impose truth on the American people. That battle is being fought right in front of us. Anybody who picks up a newspaper or watches the evening news sees it, it's right there. What do they do with it? Are they so wedded to a single political point of view that they cannot accept a wider judgment of reality? That question mark is very much in my mind and I think stares the American people right in the face today. I don't wanna allow the hour we have together to end without offering you an opportunity to talk a little bit about some of the people that are so important in your life and who are critical players in, uh, in, in your books. So if we can engage in a lightning round here, I'll ask you to offer some, some thoughts about some very important people. And let's start with Madeline Kalb. We have been married for 62 years um, I can only say that um, I fell for her the moment I saw her, and she remains beautiful in my eyes to this day, and she has been with me all the way, uh, my closest buddy and advisor, um, quite a girl. And your big brother, Bernard Cow enormously influential in my life. He, um, I think more than anyone else, steered me in the direction of Russian studies uh, to pick up the language. He thought all language is incredibly important. A journalist can go into Russia, an American journalist speaking Russian. Imagine how the advantages that you have, as opposed to going into Russia and finding yourself with a Russian interpreter. An average Russian is not going to speak to an interpreter, no. So the language was essential and Bernie pointed me in the right direction. I didn't have an opportunity to know your parents, but I did get to know your sister and at the time we first met 27 years ago, your father-in-law Bill Green was living in your home and uh, talk about your parents and Madeline's parents. Well, um, my parents, my father <clears throat> was born in a small Polish textile town called Gerardov. Um, he was by craft a tailor. He came to this country in 1914. Um, within a brief period of time became a great fan of this country and really ended up um, believing that we could probably do no wrong. However, I stressed earlier that the country gave him the opportunity to flourish. Economically, he did not, quite the contrary. But he was given the opportunity and he never forgot that. He thought that was the key. What do you do? with the opportunities that are given to you. My mother was born in Kiev, capital of Ukraine, came here in 1913, um, was, a, was sort of uh, mixing up genders here, but was kind of the kingpin of her family. Uh, she was always the brightest, uh, the most sensible, the most responsible, 
responsible. Um, a terrific person to have for a mother. <laughs> I speak with authority on that. Um, my in-laws, Rose and Bill Green. Uh, Rose was one of the smartest, most sensitive, intellectual uh, people I, I've ever met. She was also a fabulous cook. And Bill Green was a stock analyst um, and a marvelous sense of humor. Died at the tender age of 96. Um, and even as he went out was cracking jokes. And two professional colleagues, Walter Cronkite and Bill Small. Walter Cronkite was the greatest anchor man I ever worked with. He sort of just knew when you ought to do a story and how to lead into the story. Um, his kindness, uh, I thought Cronkite was outstanding. Bill Small was the bureau chief for CBS in Washington. One of the toughest guys I have ever had to deal with. Also one of the, one of the fairest, most decent men I've ever had to work with. Um, Bill Small did more to bring women into the industry than any big shot I know. He is the one who introduced people like uh, Leslie Stahl and Connie Chung at, uh, into the top ranks of CBS. Sorry? Diane Sawyer. Diane Sawyer. Yeah, yeah. Marvin, there's a poetic irony in the book. Your beginnings were Murrow's conclusions, and you in so many ways became his legacy at CBS News. You were the last correspondent personally hired by Murrow in 1957, and you were a newcomer what turned out in what turned out to be his final broadcast, the year-end roundup of 1960 called Years of Crisis. He invited you to join him when he became director of USIA and the Kennedy administration. And in a most poignant response, you said you needed to carry on his work in journalism. And so you did. Um, and in fact, the book begins and ends <coughs> with Murrow. Have you consciously felt this sense of irony of being there hand-picked, hand-selected as the final latter-day Murrow boy? Mike, that is a question I can answer from the current vantage point. I can answer it now because I am able to look back. At the time it was happening, I knew that he was special. He was, for me, an idol. I listened to his 745 newscast every night. Uh, I watched his broadcasts. His broadcast bringing down Senator McCarthy was one of the most historic pieces of television news I've ever seen, or perhaps there ever was. Uh, I was filled with admiration for what this man was able to do and did. But at the time it was happening, I was not able fully to appreciate the impact that he would have on me and many, many, many thousands of me's that have come along over the decades. Uh, wherever you are today, you will bump into a journalist who knows about Edward R. Murrow and wants to be like Edward R. Murrow. And if they could all be like Edward Amaro, we would be a much better country today. But that's a hard thing to be. That's why he is held up in the kind of esteem that he is, and deservedly so. He set an extraordinary example of courage, of professionalism, of decency, of fearlessness. If he had to say something that he knew was going to offend a senator or even a president. He said it because it was true. He believed it to be true. When Murrow, after he left CBS and went to be the head of USIA, invited me to join him to be his specialist on communist affairs, 
I was obviously flattered, but I had to say no to him and it broke my heart. I didn't, how could I say no tomorrow? That was ridiculous. The only thing I could say to him is I wanted, I want um, to do in Moscow what you did throughout your entire career. Wanted to be like you. And he understood. He did. He understood and he applauded your decision. Um, yeah. Last question, Marvin. The, the pandemic of the past year has prompted so many of us to look back at our lives, look around us in awareness of all we have and how fragile it is, and look ahead to how we want to conduct ourselves and who we want to be as this fog begins to lift. Yours is a life well lived, rich, full, and you always seem to be looking ahead. Give us your thoughts as you look back, you look around, and you look ahead in April of 2021. Let me try to look ahead for a moment. <clears throat> I am a very proud grandfather, and uh, I have a grandson of 15 named Aaron and a granddaughter of 12 named Eloise. They are both incredibly special to me. I know they are the brightest kids in the world and everybody else knows that too. But I would love for this country to be as open and rich in its potential as it was at different stages of my life, helping me along. I would like the good angels of America to in effect bless these kids and bless all of those kids who will represent the future of this country. It is a very complicated, messy world. And there aren't many examples around. This is the best example, in my judgment, the best example in the world. It's in the midst of very difficult times. And this fight between democracy and authoritarianism is a real one. It's a dangerous one. But at this particular time, we have the chance to see democracy win. And I wanted to win for Eloise and for Aaron and for all of their buddies. Because then we can all sit back and say we did a good job. <laughs> well, Marvin, that will be the last word today. And it's a good one. The book published by Brookings Press is entitled Assignment Russia, Becoming a Foreign Correspondent in the Crucible of the Cold War. Marvin Kalb, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure, Mike. Thank you, and thank the National Press Club. We are pleased to present you virtually with our National Press Club coffee mug, along with <laughs> our hope that you will join us again in person in the very near future. So thank you again, I hope so. and great good luck. This is also a good opportunity to let our viewers know that we have just signed on for the 27th season of the Calb Report with appreciation <laughs> to our underwriter in as much foundation and to Maryland Public Television and American Public Television, which will be airing and distributing our programs. Also, a word about two upcoming headliner programs at the National Press Club this Friday, April 16th. At 11 a.m., Margaret Wong, president and CEO of the Southern Poverty Law Center, will speak on the rise of hate crimes in America. And at 2 p.m. Friday, Jesse Dillon, director and executive producer of Soros, a documentary about billionaire activist and investor George Soros will discuss the film's intriguing subject along with Washington Post media reporter Paul Fari. Our thanks to producer Lindsay Underwood, to our headliners team co-leaders Donna Linewan Leger and Lori Russo, this year's president of the National Press Club, Lisa Matthews of the Associated Press, and to our wonderful National Press Club team behind the scenes here in the Broadcast Operations Center. We thank our members and guests for your questions and for joining us. Be well, stay safe, and have a good day.